welcome to um, this last part of the lecture. Um, I will wrap up chapter eight, feedback linearization that we've heard last time shortly. And then I will go into the appendix and to the example on impulsive control for orbital maneuvers and a rendezvous maneuver. So first of all, let's look into the feedback linearization um, chapter. What did we hear there? Feedback linearization is a technique which um, exploits or with which you can deal with nonlinear systems. And in the discrete time case, we speak of nonlinear difference equations. So difference equation which tells us the, the relationship between different time levels as we are used to in, in digital control by now, but it could be a nonlinear relationship. So the next time levels state values, for example, could depend. Um, so essentially that could look like this. We have x k plus one could be some vector function, maybe nonlinear of x of k and maybe of some u k. And in this setting, we've seen this example. So you have a tank and this tank is um, filled continuously with a liquid um, via this inflow and the inflow is U that will be our control input variable. We have an outflow V dot out and we have some, some volume change of this incompressible fluid in there, um, which is just uh, given by the integration of the cross-sectional area over the or the filling level H. A is the area at that filling level H, which is a function of H. And um, then we have a nonlinear relationship for the Bernoulli outflow equation, which essentially takes the form some prefactor A times square root of two times gravitational acceleration times H for an idealized outflow here. And then we have the differential equation um, is basically the the volume change over time, the, the rate of volume change is given by the volume inflow minus the volume outflow. And um, we have discretized that. So we obtained here a discrete time relationship. So a different equation, which is nonlinear using the function A, the cross-sectional area as a function of, of the height. And we have the squared expression with some simple numeric uh, integration scheme and age is obviously one possible choice, one usable choice of uh, the state vector. And the key idea here is that in this simple setting, we can write down a first order difference equation in age. So the next time levels value of the height is given by the current one plus some change over the time level, which is of course in some way approximated but um, it's a nonlinear function in both H and U and, or could be in H and U. And um, the trick here is that, and, and that leads us to this method of feedback linearization is that we can just replace this entire right hand side by an artificial input new here. And with this input, we have a trivial relationship between the input and the filling height h. Okay, if we go on then, we have this relationship that we see here as uh, we can turn that around in the sense that we can solve for the physical input u. That's not always easy, um, but we have to manage that uh, to make this method work um, because in the end, what we will need, what the controller has to output is this u. So it will have to evaluate u as a function of the state itself, of age here in this case, and of this artificial input that will be provided by some simple control law. All right, and if we can do that, sometimes only numerically, now in this case, we can do it uh, relatively easily. Um, that's the input transformation, or that's the, the transformation to the original input here in this form. So we have this formula that will be the last part of the control of the controller output function essentially, and then we have um, a simple system. Let's see here. This the simple system is actually only h k plus one equals nu of k. So that's a trivial linear linear system in h. Um, and 
we can um, come up with a linear controller which gives us new as um, as an as a controller output uh, control input to this system here and um, provides us with some dynamics in the filling level h and with some shaping here with some pt1 like um, shaping of what new should be um, we can actually describe the time evolution of h as a linear dynamics here a transfer function multiplied by um, the z domain signal representation of some reference input hd and um, that's that looks similar to our choice of dynamics of the closed loop dynamics in the internal model controller um, and the key here is that our control law which is given by this evolution equation here by this difference equation with hd as an input and new as a discrete state we can just compute that as a control law and knowing new at a particular point in time we can insert into the input um, transformation to obtain u of k which is a nonlinear function but we can evaluate it easily here and essentially what we've done is we've inscribed we prescribed this dynamics from reference input to the actual state and beneath the hood we transformed into the necessary um, input on a physical side the actual input by compensating in the right way these nonlinearities. so that's a powerful method um, we can use it not only for the simple cases um, and we've seen how this works for more complex system dynamics so for example a general system that we have here <coughs> in equation 8.5 and 8.6 here we can see that uh, again we have this uh, function f at the right hand side so essentially we have some mathematical tools to work on these equations essentially what we do is um, we define a composition operator which is there to simplify the notation of inserting and thereby substituting substituting an expression and we will use that to formulate actually future outputs. You can see that here, um, when we formulate um, the current output, it's just simply inserting into the output equation. Um, the next output would be the same, but of course with xk plus one, and we can insert our system equation right inside here. And by doing that, we call, um, we apply this, uh, composition operator here. Now, if we see that a composition is not dependent on u of k directly, then we effectively can say that we can we, have, we actually live basically in in this form, in this form, so that it actually um, is only a matter of uh, of z or of the state x of k in this case, and not of something else, which is u of k in our case that bears the meaning for us that uh, if we see that u of k does not influence this current composition we see that by evaluating this partial derivative of this expression and if we see that it's zero we see that this particular prediction of uh, y at some future time level is not at the time level k plus two here that this composition uh, or this, this time step is not directly influenced by u of k. And that's how we define the so-called relative degree of the system, namely that time level in the future that is first affected by u of k. The earlier predictions of the output do not see any effect of that input. And that's important for us because um, that allows us to construct this uh, feedback linearized form which essentially after some manipulations and insertions um, we can uh, see that we can get, go to new coordinates which we which we call here we have them zeta and eta um, grouped into those zeta contains those that um, are up to the relative degree so that's delta many with delta being this relative degree and if there are states left, which um, so if, if the relative degree is less than the system order, 
less than n, then we have additional states eta here, which will uh, produce something that we call an internal dynamic, because that will not show up in the input-output relationship. Okay, so essentially, um, we can formulate these xi's and eta's um, with uh, with the methodology that we see there in this uh, in these formulas. So we just go through this this uh, recipe in a sense, and in the end, what um, comes out is that we get evolution equations of zeta zeta k plus one is an, a chain of time shifts actually only. So one component of zeta is shifted uh, into the next component or into the prior component actually uh, over time. We see that by this um, structure of ones, one above the diagonal, all others, all other entries in this matrix are zero. And we replaced here this artificial input by the right hand side of the last um, difference equation of the last belt of the last zeta, uh, sorry, xi um, state component. And this uh, it's called V here, um, this artificial input. Um, actually, uh, from this input to the xi outputs, we have trivial linear behavior. Then we have some leftover dynamics, which is usually nonlinear down here in the etas, but uh, it's internal in the sense that it doesn't affect our output. Our output is actually psi one. Psi one is our output that we look at, and we essentially feed in our artificial input to the um, to a time shifted output to some output in the delta many samples in the future, and that tickles down to the first component after delta many time steps. And that's, uh, that's what we realize with this form. But uh, this artificial input is not what we physically apply to the system. Instead, we have to apply u of k and we have to evaluate this backwards input transform for that. That's given basically by this line down here, what we have to do. This psi function is the inversion of this function here that we define, where we define V, the artificial input, solved for U of K. If we've done that, um, we have a linear system. You see that up here, this trivial linear system on which we can do simplified linear control design. And we have uh, an additional state dynamics here, eta, which is excited by our actions in the remaining system states but it does not show up in the output. So it's uh, controllable, but not uh, a, um, an observable um, part of the system dynamic. Um, that's important because um, if it's not observable, we've learned that we cannot um, detect instabilities there. So we can in no way influence uh, or actually influence these, these states so that we stabilize them. They just happen. So one important property also is that this system dynamics given by this uh, vector Q function here in this, uh, in this setup uh, is stable, but it's a nonlinear um, system dynamics. So that could be hard to actually check. Um, that's of course uh, just an outlook to this um, to more complexity beneath the hood here if you have a more complicated system. But we've seen in an example what this dynamics actually um, how, how we can get some impression of this dynamics by looking at this linear system here. And this linear system has a zero <coughs> uh, numerator polynomial, z minus 0.8. So it has a zero in the z plane at plus 0.8. And we've seen that after doing all this transform, we can of course do that on a linear dynamic system as well. So we go into the state space. Um, do all these compositions, um, detect um, that we have first order uh, relative degree. We have two states, so that leaves us with one scalar uh, xi state and one eta state. And we constructed the system representation with some transformation. Finally, we have the transform transformed system in these new states. Um, and 
we have an input transform which we can invert easily in this case. And finally, um, we've seen that the system dynamics, here you have the system dynamics in these new states, um, is just a zero eigenvalue um, in the XI state. And we have an eigenvalue of 0.8, which is exactly the zero location of the original transfer function in, in the eta state. And then there is a one-sided coupling. So xi um, excites the eta state, but not the other way around. So we see that uh, if we would have an, uh, an all-pass behavior and non-minimal phase behavior with the zero lying outside the unit circle, then that would give rise to an unstable dynamics in eta, which is uh, problematic in that sense. Now, what we, um, we, we can apply this technique to more complex systems, to nonlinear systems, and even to multi-input, multi-output systems, but that's, um, that's, that goes beyond the scope here. Finally, we see a glimpse on what we can do <coughs> in terms of control design with these uh, input-output linearized systems. And um, there are very simple control designs. I told you before that um, we inject our reference, or actually the, the artificial input, into um, a future value of y, and then it tickles down uh, so that at some point y k plus delta is realized. So we actually realize some delta, delta fold uh, dead time that beat controller in this sense by just um, defining that the reference value for the output should directly go into the artificial input. And then it works out that we get this output that beat, beat control in a very simple fashion. Um, we also can do model following control by basically filtering the control error that we have here, W minus Y by filtering that um, with um, an expression including the desired closed loop transfer function. And by doing that, we obtain model following control. And then finally, we can do pole placement with a simplified structure here, because this structure is possible because the system representation is always such that we have only a delta many, only non-zero, uh, sorry, only zero eigenvalues. So this um, gives us a simplified Ackermann, for example, to provide uh, the state vector feedback gain. And it turns out that we exactly write down the coefficients as the control gains for these first delta many um, states, xi states, and the zeros here for the eta states. And then we have placed our poles of the external dynamics um, where we wanted them to be. All right, so that was a short wrap up on um, feedback linearization for discrete time systems. We, we, treat system, we treat the system linearization or input output linearization in more detail in the other courses, um, feedback control respectively, um, the multivariable control course that have been held this semester as well, this term. Right, um, with many parallelities. Okay, if you have <coughs> some questions on that, you can just raise them now. In the meanwhile, I will change to um, the next part where we go into this appendix chapter. What you will see now is, um, I would say a new take or an interesting application of some techniques that we have learned so far in the course. And um, you can see it, it's about orbital maneuvers and rendezvous maneuvers of spacecraft that orbit some planets, the Earth, in some, with some simplifications, but um, we'll see now what this, um, what this actually means. I will not go through this example in a very detailed manner. I will point out the main connections and main results. And um, if you want to know more, because you please read it up in more detail in, the, in this appendix. So what we are out to do is, um, I will just fast forward here. <clears throat>
essentially we have a spacecraft and as you know um, they carry some fuel with them. Mass is very critical for spacecraft um, so you want to have an, an as efficient control as possible um, to accomplish some maneuvering. So that starts with a very precise planning of um, in the first place of a rocket launch to obtain a certain orbit, uh, some orbit insertion so that you lift your spacecraft, your satellite or whatever into a particular orbit. Um, you have to be very close to optimality in that sense to be able to actually um, go to um, some orbital state, to some, to some stable orbit, um, or to, to leave the gravity well of Earth to actually escape the gravity well. Um, and uh, as you know, in rocket science, you can actually, uh, it's a good, a good analogon when you think of a, a soda can, cola or whatever, um, so you have this aluminum can, and uh, this aluminum can is filled with um, some some fluid, obviously, some some juice or whatever, lemonade. Um, that's about what a spacecraft, what a rocket actually looks like. So it's really that much liquid fuel is in there, and structural mass is really like in a tin can or even in a in an aluminum can, very thin walled, very light by far, by far the most uh, mass is dedicated to fuel. And then you may have some little piece on top, which is the actual very expensive satellite that you want to shoot up. And that's necessary um, because um, there, there is, there's the rocket equation and uh, that basically tells you there is a lot of material on the internet that just uh, pointed out quickly for you that uh, essentially um, you have to minimize your the structural mass, all the elements in a rocket um, that goes down to like five to seven percent or something like that of the entire fuel plus payload plus structural mass that you can dedicate to, um, to structural mass um, and by far the vast majority is fuel in order to be able to actually get um, payload up into orbit at all. So now the question is um, how do how do we maneuver spacecrafts in the final approach to, let's say, a space station? Or some, we want to, to maneuver towards another target, which orbits as well. That could be, for example, the ISS um, or some other satellites. And um, we take some simplifications. But essentially, what will be important to understand is that um, these spacecraft, they usually burn very short thrusts only. They will not burn a continuous thrust uh, maneuver to, to get to some new orbit, but it turns out it's actually much more efficient to, and also in terms of building typical chemical propellant uh, engines, rocket engines, um, there you typically have short bursts of relatively high force, high thrust, um, and we can see on a larger time scale we can see, uh, we can model these bursts as impulses um, of forces, and we will use that today to draw the analogon or the parallelities to impulse sampling and write down how we actually um, describe these dynamics. You see that here that we have maybe, um, for example, these four. Um, points in time where we start out and U1, U2 and so on, they describe um, vectors of these bursts, uh, thrust vectors, as our input vectors essentially to the system at particular points in time, T1 to T4. And um, we will have a look at how we can model such system dynamics. First of all, <coughs> We like to, of course, look at um, systems. Uh, let's take a linear system here, x dot equals a times x of t. That's a differential equation. And of course, with an input, we have uh, our usual input gain here as well. Now, you all remember from solving um, the differential equation over a particular time step, there we actually came up with this closed form solution or we utilized this closed form solution of that differential equation up there. Um, we have a homogeneous part 
and we have a particular solution in which the use, the inputs actually come up here. And um, we will exploit that. Uh, now we can basically think already about um, when U is composed of Dirac impulses, of short Dirac impulses, which have a particular intensity. That's how strongly we fire our engine. It's in, this, in, in, that, uh, in that particular engine time frame, how long it burns, but essentially that will be compared to the orbital dynamics will be very short. So we can approximate that as if it was a Dirac impulse. And then we know already that um, the Dirac impulse in the integrand of an integral um, essentially can be solved by dropping the integral and evaluating the integrand where this pulse hits. And that's what, that, that's what we will do. Um, let's look into the system dynamics. Yeah, that's, that, that's the Dirac delta function, um, this main properties, just to know what we're talking about, that we're on the same page. We have um, essentially, um, and yeah, you could say uh, one way to write it down uh, in the slightly simplified um, version is that delta t minus ti with some constant ti and t being some independent variable um, is um, not finite, let's say, for um, when this argument becomes zero and it is zero everywhere else. And it has the additional property that you see in A5, namely that the integral over this um, sign change of the argument is normalized to be equal to one. And our inputs, u, <coughs> u of t, will be composed of several bursts, which you can see down there in A6, um, as um, weighted by some ui. That's a coefficient in this sense here, um, how strong this particular burst is. And uh, delta t minus ti um, produces this Dirac delta distribution there. And we sum up over several of these as the, as the entire input signal. That is very similar to what we had in terms of the impulse train in the impulse, chapling, impulse sampling chapter in the beginning. Right, so if we now insert this definition of inputs into um, the closed form solution of the differential equation that we've seen up there, then um, we can directly write down after some steps here, A9 is directly the solution where the integral is solved in this kind of trivial fashion for the Dirac pulses, um, where we have a, a term here, um, an input term, you see that here on the, on the right, which um, is merely a summation of scaled, um, uh, matrix exponentials essentially. So that's a simple solution here, um, a simple structure of the solution for this linear system. And you see that we can evaluate x of t for any time when, when we just fix how, at which time we want to, to come up with the solution. It's actually what we'll get is linear in x of t zero, so linear in the initial state. And it is linear in all the UIs. The UIs were the input intensities of each burst. But we get a linear relationship here. And that's basically, um, that bears similarities when you remember how we proved um, state controllability or state observability. One of, the, one of the two, or maybe in both, we had this, this example where we wrote down um, that we wanted to arrive at a certain point or at the origin from some arbitrary initial state. And we wanted to resolve um, the, the connection between the inputs in the input sequence and the initial state to arrive at the origin after n many steps. And essentially that's the same type of uh, equation here. We get lin a linear system of equations for uh, involving the initial state, the final state, and the use in between. So essentially that's uh, a simple structure that we can use. And now let's look at the physics of the problem, how we actually model um, the orbit dynamics, the orbital dynamics. Essentially what we will take, what we'll do here 
is that we'll describe um, circular orbits only. So let's say we have a space station in uh, some stationary circular orbit, and uh, we have a chaser spacecraft, which could be, for example, the Dragon spacecraft or a Soyuz capsule or whatever. And um, what we want to describe now is um, how these two move and um, in, in terms of orbital coordinates. And then we simplify this. What we will get is, is a nonlinear relationship, a nonlinear equation of motion for each of these um, spacecraft. And we will um, linearize about um, the space station position, essentially. So the space station is considered uh, to be in a stationary orbit with some constant angular velocity around the Earth, the constant um, radius or constant altitude. And we will take this frame of reference and linearize the motion of the chaser aircraft with respect to the space station. That gives us linearized distance dynamics and then we fall into our scheme what we, which we just developed. We have a linear differential equation, linearized differential equation, and we will come to a simple form to assess how burns of thrust affect the motion so that we can resolve that all um, to obtain a particular desired maneuver. Yeah, we also look only at a planar orbit, so we're already in the right orbital plane. And um, I will just go over that relatively quickly. What we do here is we start out with <coughs> describing the position vectors in the polar coordinate system. So we have uh, coordinates rho and phi here. And um, then we can differentiate, we can construct rp dot, which is the vector in that reference frame to the chaser, or the, the velocity here in the reference frame of the chaser. And by taking all inner derivatives with us, um, we build up our, our kinematic equations here. Then once we've done that, we do that once more so that we get to acceleration. So we get an acceleration term here in A14. And um, we see that we obtain here on the right hand side of this equation, we see that we obtain a nonlinear relationship. R is um, a signal or is, yeah, you can consider R as a state or as, as some dependent variable. And phi is also a signal in time. So we see that um, there are multiplications of these quantities in the, in the brackets there in the parentheses. So we get uh, nonlinear dynamics here. We also insert Newton's second law. And finally, we get two nonlinear equations of motion here, A15, A16, where um, we have the gravity force on the right hand side and uh, on the left hand side some kinematic terms. We will further simplify that step by step so that we get um, an equation of motion only for lowercase r and um, yeah we can skip the we can eliminate the mass m here which is the mass of the chaser vehicle. Me is the mass of the earth we cannot get rid of that that's just in this gravitational constant here in, in u. And R um, is the radius of our chaser aircraft or our, of, our air, of our spacecraft. You see that mu is some fairly large number, obviously, because it contains the Earth's radius. Um, yeah, we get big numbers. That's, of course, um, likely to happen. Now, these equations of motion are nonlinear, and we can linearize them at some stationary orbital point, and that will be, for example, um, the, the International Space Station in our case. So some point of reference on a stationary orbit will be taken as the point of development of the linearization. That's now an approximated linearization that we do here in this example, not the feedback linearization, just to, just to distinguish that. And um, the resulting linearized equations are called either Hill equations or clothesy wilshire equations. Um, and they they describe the same linearized dynamics, but in different coordinate frames. The Hill equations are in Cartesian coordinates, whereas the Clothesy Wilshire equations are in polar coordinates. And what you can think of is really we, we 
we nailed down the ISS, the, the stationary target point of our maneuver. We, um, we define, we pin our coordinate system's origin there. So that's, that defines the origin of our coordinate system. And then relative to that, we will have um, the chaser's spacecraft motion described by these differential equations. How do we do that? Well, again, we, <coughs> we assume a circular orbit. So the radius um, of, the, of the origin is R0, and that's considered constant, and R0, uh, R dot is 0. With that, we can um, get to um, state values um, at which we linearize, which is this phi 0 as well, which is given by this expression, A19 here. And then, of course, we, uh, we use the substitutions um, that we described the total angle phi, respectively the, the, the actual radius um, of whatever point we describe um, as these stationary values plus some delta variables. And these delta variables are our linearized state values afterwards, um, which obey approximately at least these um, linearized dynamics. So we do some linearizations, that's a bit of a mess, but in the end we get to these highlighted equations, 24, 25, in which um, we get a second order system of, differential of linear differential equations with constant coefficients now um, for delta r and delta phi. And of course, we have to be close to, um, to the linearization point in some sense for these approximations to be valid or to be good approximations. So um, the radius delta r has to be, or the deviation delta r has to be much shorter, much smaller than r0, but r0 is essentially the Earth radius plus the orbital altitude of the ISS. So um, that's definitely the case for us when we are, end up somewhere close to the ISS, several kilometers away. Um, r0 is in the order of 6,000 kilometers. So that's, that's just to be kept in mind. Um, then these linearized equations will be a pretty accurate representation of the JSOS dynamics. Right, so um, these, when we write it down in R and phi, then we get the so-called Claude Tessy Wilshire equations. The same equations just um, expressed in different coordinates are called the Hill equations. And here we, we will continue using these Hill equations. We define X as the radius difference, so as the altitude difference. So you might be confused in the first second because X is now pointing outwards from Earth, actually. And um, Y is pointing um, in the circumferential or in a tangent, tangential direction. Um, yeah, so that's the XY system. And um, by these substitutions that you see here, going from polar to um, linearized, uh, sorry, to, to Cartesian coordinates, we obtain the Hill equations here, 27, 28. They are also um, linearized and um, have constant coefficients in which um, these phi zero and R zero um, come up. R zero actually not in this case, only phi zero, but um, that's, yeah, that's, that's the equations that we'll use now. What is beneficial is when we transform this, this system to something that we call a proper time. So we will not describe the system equation in natural time anymore. We could do that. I mean, 27, 28, do that. But we can further simplify these equations when we go to some time, which is scaled by um, a period length, capital T, and this period length is actually um, the orbital period, 2 pi divided by phi zero dot. So that's how many, you know, how many radians per second the, um, the ISS does. You see that in this picture, figure A4, um, indicated here as um, the angular rate at which the ISS uh, orbits the Earth. Um, you may know that the ISS orbits the Earth roughly every 90 minutes. Um, and um, as far as I'm informed now, as I remember now, 
so basically that's a, a well-known figure and um, we'll get capital T as the number of seconds um, that the ISS needs to, to go around Earth once. And rescaling the time, lowercase t, by this capital T, by this orbital period, we get some simplifications. Um, we have to carry that into the derivatives. You see that here, in this bunch of substitutions. And finally, we get two um, equations that you see down here, which look very, I would say, canonical. They only um, are rescaled by t squared. <coughs> And eventually, um, yeah, we can formulate now, the next step is to formulate these um, input bursts that we have, the thrust burns, um, in this XY coordinate system. So we will have two components per, um, per thrust, essentially, or for the thrust, which is, um, we, can call, we, can, we can define that in the time level tau, in this normalized time, or, in the time, in the natural time t, depending on which differential equations we use. And um, we will take u, or we will represent the thrust u as um, the acceleration imposed currently at instantaneously, which is the force, the thrust force in the corresponding x or y directions divided by the spacecraft mass. And now we consider that the spacecraft mass is constant, so this coefficient becomes constant. Then for, for small burns um, in orbit for terminal guiding of, of the maneuver, that will work out. Okay, so finally, inserting all of that, including the input definition that we have here, we will get these Hill equations in proper time or eigentime. Um, that's essentially what we'll use. You can use that now to simulate the system dynamics in MATLAB, of course, um, and we can also recast that into a state space system. It's just a second order, a system of second order differential equations, which we can cast into first order form by taking x prime, x, y prime, and y as states, for example, and get the associated um, equations of motion. Here we have them, um, a continuous proper time system here. So it's not seconds in natural time, but it's this normalized time. But all the, the math stays essentially the same. Um, so we have Q derived, uh, the rate of Q in terms of eigentime here is some A matrix times um, the states plus the B vector times this U expression in, in, in the time tau. And you see that the A matrix, because we use this eigentime or this proper time now, this A matrix is constant and with some values one or some values multiples of pi or pi squared. Um, so they, they always look like that because we use this proper time. That's the nice thing. We can just hard code basically this matrix um, and have the system representation correctly. Now we also know that um, this is the solution of the, of the system at any particular time, starting from some initial time, or some initial state Q0. Um, we just have a transition matrix E to the A tau um, to arrive at time tau. And of course, that's an autonomous system. Here, we don't see um, the B times U bar part. That would be the homogeneous solution, but obviously we need some inputs in order to affect where we are, where we are going um, over time to really drive some maneuver. So this one here is just a free motion without U in A39. And um, we can look at what actually happens. There are four cases when we initialize at different velocities in different directions. Um, how these systems, um, how, how the system actually um, evolves over time. And we always initialized it here <coughs> with a particular velocity, y0 prime, for example, at a, particular, um, at a particular value, which corresponds to one meter per second. So we just um, transformed that into the corresponding meter per revolution, eigentime, eigentime or proper time. And 
what we call projectile here is just this, this chaser spacecraft. Um, and that, that's really intriguing in these equations. Orbital dynamics is in this, in this sense weird in the first, at first glance. When you actually start out with a motion forward in the, uh, into the orbital direction, what will happen is that the chaser aircraft will instantly start pulling up to a higher orbit. You see that here. We start, we start essentially here at tau equals zero in the origin of this representation here. Um, horizontally is um, the tangen tangential direction and vertically up is towards space and down is towards Earth. So um, we start at, uh, at this indicated point here um, and Q zero, so the, the velocity vector um, Y zero is drawn here to the right. It's greater than zero, so we initialize the system. So at zero, zero, it would be in a stationary orbit, just aligned with the ISS, essentially. Now, if you initialize or if you give it a bump in orbital motion direction, if you just accelerate it here in, in, in that tangential direction, what instantly will happen is that the system will pull up to a higher orbit. You see that we go to this, go up this branch here. And uh, at some point, namely at um, after half a revolution around the Earth, we will uh, get to this uh, maximum altitude. And then we will, interestingly, in doing that, we will fall back behind the ISS or behind the starting point. So at an outer orbit, um, the, the angular velocity is lower than on, an, on, on a lower orbit. So what will happen is that we will gradually actually fall back. You see that we come back down to the, to, to turn around essentially here at, um, at the radius at which the ISS is located after tau equals one. And that means that we have completed one, one round around the earth, but now we're suddenly 1.6 kilometers behind the ISS, which stayed on its orbit nicely. And we just attempted to accelerate, but we did the opposite in, in, in that sense. That's really the non-plausible dynamics in orbital mechanics. Um, and you see that um, we don't have damping or anything in this uh, in the system equations. It's really um, preserving energy. So um, we will see some periodic motion, and it will just will just fall back and back and back over time. The the inverse case is true when we seemingly break down when we actually put a thrust in the opposite direction that lets us fall down to lower al lower um, altitudes but not forever if we are not stuck in the atmosphere and break down if we are still in vacuum um, we will actually speed up uh, in that sense that uh, we will overtake from below the ISS or the reference point and end up after one period some here in this case one and a half kilometers in the front after going around the earth once. Um, and then we have the cases where we actually initialize by a vertical burst or a vertical bump. We initialize uh, our chaser at the ISS but with an upward velocity and we see that we go to higher orbits um, thereby we fall back but then in some symmetric fashion, after half a revolution around the Earth, we end up at the same altitude, but further back than the ISS. And then, but we fall down in that sense and we go to lower orbit and um, again, compensate for we actually go to a closed orbit here um, that ends up at the ISS location after exactly one round around the Earth. And the same is mirrored if we kick down the spacecraft initially, then we first go to lower orbit, we go forward, um, we come back up to a higher orbit, we fall back to end up exactly at the ISS location after one round trip around the Earth. So that's the open loop or the uncontrolled dynamics of that system, which is pretty weird, um, but we can perfectly well approximate these dynamics and represent it as a linear differential equation. And we can also look at the inputs, here you see, a compilation of all these trajectories with these initial states. Um, all right, let's let's do some maneuvering. So um, 
we will simplify the task a little bit in the sense that we will look at discrete thrusts, um, this thrust vector ui here, um, u bold u bar i, um, is associated with some particular point in time, t or tau i, at which um, this thrust in terms of um, a Dirac pulse in that particular direction given by the vector u bar i uh, will be executed. And um, we can space um, the, the times from the first to the last burn uh, equidistantly over time, for example. That's now what we will do. That's a simple approach now. Um, so we have some given final time of the maneuver, tau final or tau fin. Um, we initially, we will, here in this scope, we will assume that we know when we want the maneuver to be finished. Um, so we will prescribe this value. And then we may have several burns. The first one is at zero, and then at equidistance um, times, delta tau is here the time step in a sense. And um, after capital N many steps, um, we arrive at the final time. So that's how we will frame our maneuver and we will apply some thrusts, some bursts of thrust at these tau i times. So we can rewrite or write down this um, u bar vector as a function of tau by using the delta distribution and the u bar i values, which we can see as delta x i prime and delta y i prime. Why can we do that? Well, what we're looking at is essentially um, a second order kinematic equation. So some acceleration equals some other coupling terms and the right hand side, the, the force input is like a force, but we divided it, if you remember, by the mass. So essentially the, U, the definition of u is um, in terms of accelerations in this eigen, in this proper time. Um, and now if we use um, Dirac pulses here, if you remember from mechanics, when we have a collision and we compute with collisions, these, these uh, billiard balls or pool balls, um, these, these problems where you hit it, <coughs> where it hits one ball, hits another ball in a perfect collision, um, then the momentum is exchanged there energy is exchanged and um, we we have this situation here essentially when when we provide some acceleration Dirac input that that its integration corresponds to a change in velocity and that's meant here in a43 where the velocity change delta x prime and delta y prime um, are the components actually of this intensity vector u and now that's what we want to find. Um, we will do that here in two ways, um, in a tutorial or in a shorted form, essentially. Um, you should already see how the structures come together. What we can do here now is we can directly write down an optimization problem and use MATLAB to solve it. So for example, we can formulate some cost function f um, of some variables phi just very generally and minimize that. And that could be some fuel consumption, for example, or the total sum of um, the delta X and delta Y components that we get here, or the delta X prime, delta Y prime components in the U vector. And we want to have um, a terminal condition G of phi exactly equal to zero. That would be, for example, that at the final time, um, the state vector is the origin so that we actually end up at the origin location after the final time. Another question is, of course, how can we get there? How can we solve this system? Well, if you do that with MATLAB and um, write down essentially your equations of motion in, the, in a suitable form, so we can say that um, G of phi should be the state after the final time, and we have already derived expressions for that, namely, um, this, this linear equation here. Um, 
essentially um, we have the, the free motion trajectory here in the front and then we have some contribution which we can design and our design variables will be essentially um, as you see down here the components in the u bar vectors so how the bursts should be oriented and how strong they should be that's coded in these delta x prime delta y prime um, entries and in the end we want to um, to have q final or to, to this, this to be q final and if that's zero then we are in the origin in the end q is the state vector here so essentially um, I, by now I would expect you that the, if you remember this discussion on controllability, that's exactly the same problem that we started writing down there. We looked for UIs. Um, in that case, these UIs were spaced apart um, by one sampling in some by one sampling duration. <clears throat> in this case, you can consider it likewise, but we have always two components two input channels if you want for one particular time level here. And we get this matrix G, which essentially looks like the controllability matrix in discrete time here. Right, and um, what we often can use for optimization, optimization problems like that um, would be some quadratic form. For example, one like this, and that's our cost function. And essentially when we have phi, you remember this phi were all the intensities in the different directions of the bursts. Um, if we square them and add them all up, that's exactly what A51 does. So it's a squared sum of um, thrust components and we want to make those small. And the optimization problem has to manage somehow a good distribution of these, um, of these thrusts and thrusts sizes and, and orientations to fulfill the final um, condition that we end up at the final point in time that's given by this a48 for example or this condition a46 they're all equivalent uh, in that sense it's just some substitutions in between so essentially um, this, the optimization problem has to manage to land at the iss in the end but uh, should use minimal fuel, which is given here, for example, or at least in that, in an approximate fashion, um, we could use A51 for that. That's an equality constraint optimization problem. And um, you probably have heard in mathematics when discussing about optimization and minimum seeking, um, that if you have equality constraints, there is a method called the Lagrangian method, um, where you formulate, we reformulate as, uh, I can just draw that down here quickly. So you have an optimization problem um, with equality constraints. And then you, you take the Lagrangian approach and you obtain an optimization problem in more variables but without constraints, unconstrained. And that's, that's of course very nice when you can do curve discussion without worrying about constraints anymore. And you do that by um, taking your original objective function and subtracting Lagrange multiplier times the expression, the implicit expression of these equality constraints and these Lagrange multipliers given here by lambda, um, as well as our variables phi, which are our components in the input vectors, um, are unknowns to the, to the optimization problem now. So we have new unknowns. We have the lambdas as well, which are unknown, but now we look at an unconstrained optimization problem. And uh, by that we can solve a simpler but larger problem. Right, so we minimize that. We can minimize nicely when we have this quadratic objective and we have linear equality constraints here um, after some, um, some derivation, we put the, we, we, 
construct the partial derivatives of the Lagrangian of this function here, of this curly L function with respect to lambda and to phi. You see here the expressions. And the nice thing about that is these expressions here are linear in all the unknowns. And again, the unknowns are phi and lambda. So that's a linear system of equations that give us, um, that's essentially the gradient of this unconstrained optimization problem. And we set this gradient to zero to find a stationary point in the lambda phi space. And by finding that, by evaluating or solving this linear system of equations um, for phi and lambda, we get a candidate in the first place for an optimum. And this optimum here in, in our case turns out to be a minimum. So we get uh, to solve this minimization problem. And um, we do some substitutions here to solve this problem actually. Um, for example, uh, we come up with the coefficients times um, the unknown vectors equals some right hand side. You will remember this type of rearranging linear equations uh, from where did we have it in the model following control chapter. We had uh, similar manipulations and also the, the eigenvalue, eigenvector problem where we um, looked at the solution of the algebraic Riccati equation. There we also manipulated similar structures. So essentially we get known coefficient matrices on the left, then we have an unknown vector phi lambda and a right hand side which we can compute and we can solve that essentially by this operation. Um, if the inverse here is defined, we can solve that and that gives us um, the phi and lambda entries. Now we can actually see what, uh, when we can, uh, when can we solve this system actually, A56, when, when can we go from A56 to A57? Maybe some of you see it, could you maybe tell me if you can spot something here. When can we invert this, left matrix here, I, G transpose, G zero. One observation that we can take here is we have the identity matrix to the top left, which has obviously its full rank as, as large as it is. And we have the G matrix uh, and G transposed complementing it on either side. And now the question is, is the entire matrix um, regular? Can we, can we get to full rank or when can we get to full rank of the entire matrix here? And the answer is it's determined by the rank of the G matrix here, right? So the G matrix, <clears throat> if we go back up, we said the G matrix, um, is equivalent in our case here, maybe up to some factor, but actually I think it's exactly equivalent to the controllability matrix of the system. A49 is the controllability matrix. So um, what we can see here is that the, if the system is fully controllable, then G has full rank, and then um, we could show, or then it's plausible and, and we can test it, that this matrix on the left-hand side of A56 is of full rank and uh, we can invert it. So that again ties all these concepts a little bit together. Here we need full controllability in order to um, solve this system. And that's, that's plausible because the equations look like the controllability problem it's exactly. All right, let's have a look at a short look at some results. Um, so we initialize with some initial position error at five kilometers lower and 20 kilometers further back. And um, we have some initial Y velocity. So we, we are faster, we're lower, but we are still faster than, uh, than the ISS. And um, the final state vector is not exactly at zero, zero, zero. That we, we, don't want to crash into the ISS, but it's 100 meters behind the ISS. And then you can do the rest by 
um, simple maneuvering essentially by, by some homing in control on site even. Um, all right, so we look at several numbers of bursts. We prescribe the numbers. I will just go over the text here. You can go into the details on your own, of course. And we can see that we can solve this optimization problem. So we try to find burns, burn, um, so we fix the burn times for a particular number of burns. And um, we, we get to some, some results here, how much thrust in total we, we need in an aggregated fashion. And we see that if we give ourselves, for example, time to, uh, to use one full period to complete the maneuver from Q0 to Q final, then uh, we see that with two burns only, we have uh, what turns out to be very high fuel costs. We need a lot of fuel to, to correct the spacecraft's motion, whereas for three or four or five burns, we have a total sum which is very small and all relatively similar. So then we can actually exploit the orbital dynamics quite nicely. Interestingly, if we try to, to finish the maneuver in half the time, in total, we always need more um, fuel than, uh, than when we give ourselves more time in an optimal solution. But you see here that here with two burns, we actually get uh, a fairly good solution, even the best solution for, um, for this particular final time. So essentially that will be a burn in the beginning and a burn in the end. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's, that's typical results that you get here. And for the short time trajectory, maybe let's have a look. I think we have some pictures here. Yeah, so this one, uh, it's just cut off here, uh, but anyway, we should um, be able to spot what happens. For example, here we start out at time zero and we finish the maneuver at time 0.5, so after half an Earth, Earth's revolution, and we will get uh, an initial burn which, which lets us go um, down and forward here, and the final burn which uh, stops the motion in this relative coordinate system. Then we have, so that's all the short ones. We see that um, we get burns at intermediate times. If, of course, if we, if we set the system up to have more burns, but we've seen that we will need actually more fuel to do that. Now let's see if we give ourselves a full period length of time. Um, with only two burns, it does something very strange, namely it, um, it, has, uh, it, it strongly starts falling down by 80 kilometers, and then it's, uh, it's rising up again on its own, of course, as we've seen in the initial, um, in the initial uh, studies, and it falls back down towards the ISS, and then a strong burst in the end stops the relative motion. We do a lot of way there. You see that um, this initial 20 kilometers or so between the two, uh, the, the initial and the final position is a very short distance here in this entire graph. And we do many hundreds of kilometers of, uh, of ride here. Um, and it's associated to large fuel burn. Um, these direct burns here is basically direct, um, paths that we get here when we do three or four or more burns is much more fuel efficient and um, you see that we basically just kick it up a little bit here, um, then do some correction burn in, in, at half time, then it's much slower homing in to the end and then in the end we arrive here at t tau equals one. So you see that we get several different um, possibilities of how this maneuver looks like. And I think it's a nice illustration of what we can do with linearized dynamics, how we can work with systems with this particular um, thrust bursts, which is very much like um, an, an impulse, a Dirac impulse, and thereby we have means to solve these equations of motion actually very elegantly. Um, and it's closely tied to the sampling operations that we have in digital control.